I would like to call the public forum for the Des Moines School Board to order for Tuesday, April 6th, 2021. Ms. Jenkins, can you please take the roll? Mr. Barron? Here. Ms. Bradley? Here. Ms. Caldwell Johnson? Mr. Cody? Here. Ms. Della Gardell? Here. Ms. Martirano? Here. Ms. Sawyer? Here. The first item of business is approval of the agenda. May I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda? I move approval. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Barron and a second by Ms. Martirano. Please take the vote. Mr. Barron? Yes. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Mr. Cody? Yes. Ms. Della Gardell? Yes. yes. Ms. Martirano? Yes. Ms. Sawyer? Yes. The vote is approved 6-0. The next item on our agenda is approval of the minutes from our meeting on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Martirano, I move approval of the minutes. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Martirano and a second by Mr. Barron. Ms. Jenkins, please take the vote. Mr. Barron. Yes. Ms. Bradley. Yes. Mr. Cody. Yes. Ms. Della Gardell. I believe I need to abstain from this. That's right. Yes. Ms. Martirano. Yes. Ms. Sawyer. Yes. The vote is approved five and we have abstain of one. The next item on the agenda is the consent items. We allow any person the opportunity to speak to the board for up to five minutes following the presentation of an agenda item. If anyone wishes to speak to an agenda item, please email aaron.jenkins at dmschools.org. Remarks must be germane to the agenda and we ask that you avoid reference to personalities and character attacks as those types of comments serve no productive purpose. We appreciate your input. As a reminder to the board in public, the board will not engage in discussion or deliberation with the speaker regarding comments made to agenda items. Discussion and deliberation will remain among board members at the board table with speakers' comments informing said discussion, deliberation, and determinations as deemed necessary. Ms. Jenkins, do we have any speakers? We do not. Mr. Barron, I believe you have the consent motion. That's right. I move that the board approve the consent items in accordance with the recommended action for each item on the consent agenda, including bills previously authorized, certified, and approved for payment by the board secretary in the amount of $17,549,374.04 and procurement card transactions in the amount of $375,307.02. Is there a second? Cody, second. We have a motion by Mr. Barron and a second by Mr. Cody. Is there any discussion or questions? Mrs. Bradley. Uh, yes, Stella Gardell. Um, I was still trying to pull up my agenda, so I apologize because I didn't ask for which item uh, is potentially be pulled and it's nothing more that I haven't done in the past. I would just like to draw uh, the public's attention to consent item C13, which is textbook for non-public schools. This is a rather a uh, routine matter uh, that Iowa Code sets forth that we do. Um, I just wanted it to be stated for the record that these are things that I occasionally pull and vote no to because this is the kind of pass through funding that I have objections and questions about, just as general process in the way that our state handles things. Um, so I just wanted to raise that up for our public as just a moment of education on the way that school funding is just incredibly interesting right now between public and private entities. Thank you, Ms. Delafardo. So I, you were chopping in and out. Are you? Do you want that item to be pulled? No, okay. it's fine. Okay. And sometimes I would pull it, but I think for tonight it's enough to just okay. mention that that's where we're at with how funding works. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Delafardo. Are there any other discussion or questions? I have a question regarding items five, the staff computer refresh, as well as seven, the student computer refresh how are we determining which machines will be replaced with these refreshes and on what um I, at what frequency will we be updating these moving forward 
Um, I don't, uh, I don't have that information you're, you're directly. Oh, whoops, sorry. I don't have that information, the rotation information, but we do have a schedule. Um, typically, it's three or four years, depending on the machine, and so they're 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 um, shuffled out in the same order in which they were originally distributed. Thank you. And I don't know if Dan Dan's on the line. He may have a, a more detailed. Um, yes. For you. Yes, Dr. Harris, that is correct. They are replaced every four years. So these uh, staff machines are the four-year-old machines that are being replaced, and the student machines, um, yes. they are four years old as well. So these aren't Correct. new ones from the COVID um, release. No, no, no. These are these are the ones replaced in any machine older than four years old. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Ms. Jenkins, will you please take the vote? Mr. Barron. Yes. Ms. Bradley. Yes. Mr. Cody. Yes. Ms. Della Gardell. Yes. Ms. Martirano. Yes. Ms. Sawyer. Yes. The consent items are approved. Six zero. The next item on our agenda is D1 public hearing for North High School Science Room renovation. Superintendent Ahart, will you please introduce the matter? I recommend the board review the proposed plans and specifications prepared by Studio Melee for the renovation of space at North High School to include two science classrooms, hold a public hearing, and approve the plans. May I have a motion and a second to approve item D1? Sawyer, so moved. Mayor Toronto, second. We have a motion by Ms. Sawyer and a second by Ms. Martirano. Are there any discussion or questions? Ms. Jenkins, please take the vote. Mr. Barron. Yes. Ms. Bradley. Yes. Mr. Cody. Yes. Ms. Della Gardell. Um, did we actually call an out of our public hearing? I'm sorry. Did you call a public hearing to order and I missed it? I'm sorry. I, I did, yes. Okay, I must have out. Yes, I'm sorry. I just okay, want to make sure we follow the process. Um, Ms. Martirano. Yes. And Ms. Sawyer. Yes. The vote is approved 6-0. The next item on our agenda is D2 public hearing for the sale of a portion of vacated Fremont Street Row. Superintendent Ahart, would you please introduce the matter? Yes, I recommend the board approve the sale of a portion of the vacated Fremont Street right of way to University Group LLC in the amount of one dollar following a public hearing. We have a motion and a second to approve item D2. Sawyer, so moved. Second. Della second. Okay, I have a motion by Ms. Sawyer and a second by Della Gardell. Is there any questions or discussion? Ms. Jenkins, please take the vote. Mr. Barron. Yes. Ms. Bradley. Yes. Mr. Cody. Yes. Ms. Della Gardell. Yes. Ms. Martirano. Yes. And Ms. Sawyer. Yes. Vote is approved 6-0. The next item on our agenda is D3, public hearing for fiscal year 2021 budget amendment hearing. Superintendent Ahart, would you please introduce the matter? I recommend the board approve the budget amendment for fiscal year 2021 as presented following the public hearing. I have a motion and a second to approve item D3. Della Gardell, move approval. Cody, second. We have a motion by Ms. Della Gardell and a second by Mr. Cody. Is there any discussion or questions? Ms. Jenkins, will you please take the vote? Mr. Barron. Yes. Ms. Bradley. Yes. Mr. Cody. Yes. Ms. Della Gardell. Yes. Ms. Martirano. Yes. And Ms. Sawyer. Yes. The vote is approved 6-0. The next item on our agenda is D4, public hearing for fiscal year 2022, budget hearing and adoption. Superintendent Ahart, would you please introduce the matter? I recommend the board adopt the proposed budget for fiscal year 2022 following the public hearing in order to submit the budget to Polk County 
by April 16, as required by law. I have a motion and a second to approve item D4. This is Barron, I move approval. Delegate, I'll second. We have a motion by Mr. Barron and a second by Ms. Delegate. Is there any discussion or questions? I have a question. Um, for the superintendent, I um, budgets are, are rarely, our, our engagement with them is really this specific, but um, I was in a meeting today uh, on preschool or where preschool was discussed. And um, I know we're in a enrollment deficit relative to typical years. And so our, our allocation would be less. And um, can you just give a, um, a quick synopsis of, of where that stands and maybe some reassurance that if there are kids that sign up, families that sign their children up for a four-year-old preschool next year that we'll be able to serve them? Yes. I, <coughs> excuse me. Yes, that's a, 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 a very pertinent question. Yes, we will be able to serve um, all the four year olds that that enroll. Um, there's there's been some allowance in the legislature for flexibility and use of funds, so we will be able to go to ad get additional spending authority to to um, open additional rooms if we have that necessity. So nobody should be hesitating to um, register their, their students for preschool if they want preschool, and we hope everyone does. So don't let, don't, don't have any reservations about that. We have the space and we will, um, we will create as many new classrooms as, as needed. Thank you, that's, that's all I had. Um, I have a quick question relating to um, the tax rate, which um, our public will notice is decreasing um, for next year. And we see some funds have changed a little bit. So Shashank, I know most people probably won't care why their taxes are going down. They'll just be happy that they are. But could you give us just kind of the brief overview for everyone listening at home of, of what's going on there? I think you need to unmute. Is that good? Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you. So there are quite a few moving parts as far as property tax rate, which is going on. <clears throat> so in the general section, because of the budget guarantee, the rate is actually going up. However, the cash reserve levy, which we is no longer in place, is reducing the overall rate in the general section. The other section was Apple which was when we had come to the community for approval, we, we, had, we had promised to them that even though the rate would be going up, the overall property tax rate would not be impacted. But because of the cash reserve levy, which is no longer in place, even though the budget guarantee amount is kicking in and the increased PEPL rate is coming in, overall rate is dropping. So the biggest driver for reduction is basically the cash reserve levy. And to some extent, the management rate. If I may add one more little tidbit to that, that is um, unclear at this time, but the legislature is considering discontinuing the uh, the Pearl levy. We're one of, I think, 17 districts that have it. And for us, it generates about a million dollars a year. You may remember a few years ago, um, we discontinued, largely discontinued our adult education program, which was funded by the Pearl so that we could shift those dollars to support things that were more um, mission specific, namely middle school activities. Um, so if if indeed the legislature discontinues that levy, even though that was voter approved in Des Moines and has been in place now for a few decades, um, that will be one more budget challenge and one more um, and one more change to the tax rate. I'm curious, Dr. Ahart, the participation with the virtual uh, budget hearing that was held mm -hmm. and the, the Q&A session, um, was participation high? Did we have many questions from the community? Do you foresee moving forward in this fashion? Yeah, I'm really encouraged. We had um, over 3,300 um, individual hits on the on the on our budget the budget forum page 
um, which is, you know, exponentially larger than the total that we've gotten in a year, um, you know, in, in all four public forums, you know, in-person public forums that we used to have. Um, questions, I think Shashank may have a better guess on the number of, of questions. We, we covered a few of them the other day when we met, but I don't, I'm not sure what the total number of questions was. Do you have a, a an estimate on that, Shashank? Sure. Uh, we received almost a dozen questions from various community people. And this was definitely a lot higher than what we had received last year. The other thing I would supplement to what Dr. Ahart said was even on the Facebook, we, there were at least 15,000 plus people who reached us out on Facebook. And we actually had a promotion going on for $10 per day so that there's more traction on that. Even on Twitter, we had over 5,500 people who actually saw the thing. And on the YouTube, there were almost 223 times people went live to actually watch it. So I think there was a huge traction that we got on the virtual budget forum. I personally, I have never presented in person because the first year that I presented was last year that was virtual. And again, this year is virtual. So I can't really have a comparison. Maybe, uh, maybe Dr. Ahart can share how many questions or participants would come in which in, in, in person forums. So the the dozen or so questions that we received, were those just answered individually or did we produce an FAQ of any type or? So we have provided the comments on our web portal where we posted the budget. So the questions asked, so the questions, there were some common questions that were being asked. So we did not go on that web portal question by question, but every question that was raised was addressed to on the web portal itself. And we have also provided responses to the individuals who had, who, uh, who had submitted questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, Ms. Jenkins, will you please take the vote? Mr. Barron? Yes. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Mr. Cody. Yes. Ms. Della Gardell. Yes. Ms. Martirano. Yes. Ms. Sawyer. Yes. The vote is approved 6-0. The next item on our agenda is E1, third grade reading, Black Males Monitoring Report. Um, this evening, I don't know if AJ is on the call. We do have our coach AJ that will be joining us this evening at some point um, on our call. We will be going through our monitoring report. Um, I am grateful for board colleagues who want to practice um, this facilitating the monitoring process. So my board colleague Kelly Sawyer will be taking us through our monitoring practice this evening. I do want to remind my board colleagues that AJ is available if we have any questions or if there's a question that you're thinking about asking and you just want to check about if it's the right time to ask that question. And then also once AJ joins us, he might um, jump in just to give some coaching advice. So please don't, um, just so you know what's going on, that he might do that as we're continuing to learn this. Um, we did not get to have our practice in March. And so... Um, we're going to be practicing this now. Um, Dr. Ahart, are you okay with us proceeding in this way? Did you want to say anything before we get started with our, proce our process? No, I think that's fine. Okay, great. I will turn it over then to my board colleague, um, Ms. Kelly Sawyer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, board colleagues, I'm excited to be leading us through this conversation tonight. AJ, I saw that you are now joined joining us or you're with us. So I appreciate uh, your leadership and guidance. Is This is my first time walking through this process. So uh, encourage that feedback. So board you're colleagues, <laughs> thank you. Uh, board colleagues, just to bring us back to the purpose of monitoring, our goal of monitoring our, or the purpose of monitoring our, um, our goals is that we engage in this process to evaluate that um, the alignment that we have between the community's vision and the district's reality is in uh, is intact. So we have three board goals. 
if you recall, back in the first or our first meeting in March, March 2nd, the only meeting in March, we did review board goal number one, which is the third grade reading overall students. And so tonight we are monitoring uh, third grade reading for black males. Um, so going to walk us through that process. Uh, but I just want to draw your attention and I hope I know that you've seen it before, but it is the it's a template of who, what, why, and how. So just as a reminder of what we're going to be doing tonight, we're going to talk about the walk through these questions, starting with the who, what, and why before we get to the how questions. So I'm going to try and keep us best on task. So as you have formulated your questions in preparation for tonight, uh, make sure and lift those questions up first. And as you are talking through or identifying a question, if you can, Align that with a page number. If you are specifically relating it to data, please identify what page number you're addressing that question. Uh, as we get started, we want to ask ourselves a few questions just to make sure we're going to proceed in this process. So our first question we want to ask is, does our report clearly show what is being monitored? What's what our specific policy? What's our end date, our goal and interpretation? So I asked that to my board colleagues. Does this report have that information present? Yes, it does. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Second question. Does this report show the data for the three previous reporting periods? And does it clearly show the current reporting period? I believe so. Yes. 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 Thank you. Um, Next question, does it clearly show the superintendent's evaluation of the performance? Yes, yes, it does. Yes. Great. And lastly, does this report show supporting documentation that evidences the superintendent's evaluation of where the district is at? Yes. Okay. And if the district is not on target, is there evaluation implicating why? Uh, we're not on target and does it clearly describe any needed next steps? All right, I'm seeing some some nods. Yes, thank you. So those are the first questions we want to make sure that we answer in our monitoring reports so that we know that we are set and ready to move forward. So with that, I would actually open it up to my board colleagues. Again, keeping us on task for the who, what, and why questions, the how questions we will eventually get to, uh, but we wanna make sure we understand this data first before we get to that how. So I open the table up for questions at this time. Uh, I guess uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, the top of the report there says this is March 2nd data. Is that? Is this data actually a, a, over a month old, or is that a, a typo? No, it's actually it's it, it is a, a month old because there has not been another testing period. So this was pulled at the same time as the all third grade um, data that we reported out on um, in March. Okay, yeah, I figured that was the case, but I just got tripped up. So then, I guess my second related question is: we should be creeping up on the next testing window right now, maybe already in it. Is that are we close to that window? Yes, we are. This report is also marked as draft. I'm guessing that um, sh should not be the case. It's watermarked as a draft. Oh, I changed the. I I caught that today because you had pointed that out last time. So I did. I did exchange it out. Um, okay. I don't have the most up to date. Okay. The, yeah. So the the watermark's off. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you for calling that out. And Ms. Martirano, I did notice that uh, the same thing and I did check the website. And so the one that's up on the website does not have the watermark. Thank you. I pulled mine too early. <laughs> um, I would like to ask a question regarding uh, page one data. Um, you know, winter of 2019, we're looking at the percent of third grade male students, uh, black male students overall. So all black male third graders in this particular um, item on page one. And in winter 
of last year, we were at 44% on track. And of course, we didn't have a spring uh, reporting period. And then our fall and winter scores um, dropped nearly 20%. Um, and I, based on our previous monitoring, I guess I would expect the, the fall, but at not seeing much increase. What, uh, what's currently happening, what currently was happening in between fall and winter with our black male students that we didn't um, improve scores a little bit with the return um, of our students? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's a variety of, I think there's a variety of, of reasons. Um, one is that there was a, in addition to the gap in, in not completing, um, not really completing last school year, um, the gap between when they ended school and when they started school was much, much longer. And so that transition back into instruction was, uh, was a lot more challenging than normal. The other piece that I think we, we forget about very easily is when, when we're in hybrid instruction, um, students are actually receiving half, um, you know, half the amount of instruction that they normally would receive. And so, especially with reading, where that frequency is really, really important, especially for our struggling readers that haven't, uh, you know, that haven't haven't internalized some of those, some of that automaticity that we that all of our students need to get get to to become proficient readers. Um, that was particularly harmful for our develop <clears throat> our developing readers. So we we do expect as we move into the the last testing period, now that we've had a, a period of time where we've really had five days a week um, for all those for, for all students, um, but but especially for those students that are in person, which is about um, I don't have it broken down by black male students, but about seventy percent of our elementary students are in person now. Um, I think we're going to see um, a, a much greater gain in that last testing period than we saw between fall and winter. But that's the biggest, clearly the biggest factor um, interfering with progress. Um, I think I have a question, even though it starts with what. Um, what do the eight schools who met the benchmark have in common? You know, I don't know that, that we can really draw any meaningful, um, um, meaningful um, conclusions from from those eight schools. Um, they they really vary considerably in in both the number of black male students that they serve, um, as well as as other factors, um, especially ELL. So, which is one thing actually that I wanted to to just point out. Miss Caldwell Johnson had asked, um, I believe it was Miss Caldwell Johnson at our last meeting, had asked about the percentage of students that that fell into um, both special education and ELL, in addition to being black male. And uh, for all of our third grade black, I'm sorry, all of our K through three um, black male students, 16% of them are identified as special education and 25% are identified as ELL. So there's a, a, a convergence of, of a few different um, challenges there that that particularly impact this group of students. I know that this data is um, incredibly focused. So Kelly, if this question is not a question that I should be asking at the time, let me know. But what I'm wondering is, is there anything that can be drawn in common amongst the resources that the students at these schools have, whether it's um, experience or training of the teachers or different community supports like I know that we have different programs present in other schools are are any of these, is there any conclusion drawn among that um I don't believe so but that's certainly something that <coughs> we could take a deeper look at 
but we 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 work really uh, you know really hard to make sure that we we provide equity of resources around the district now the 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 one thing that that um that i'll come back to to you all with uh, at least via email is um and we talked about this a bit i believe it was in march is the the gap that we have in title one funding and and schools that demographically look very very similar but because they're there isn't quite enough um, free and reduced percentage at a school. They don't qualify for Title I support. And so you can see two schools, um, the schools that just got into the, the Title I funding and then the, the, the school that didn't quite get into Title I funding, the populations look very, very similar, um, but the first school would have received a, a significant amount of resources to address just this issue. So there is an issue there, and, and that's a, another, that's a, a real challenge for us to actually give additional support for those schools that qualify for Title I, but that don't receive it because we have to be able to demonstrate to um, to the state and to the federal government via the state that that any funding that a Title I school receives is above and beyond what they would have received had they not been Title I. So, it, it becomes a, a, a real challenge to provide appropriate supports, even with local um, and state funding um, for those schools that we would really love to provide more support for. Just as a side note, Dr. Harris, I'm gonna follow up with you regarding uh, Title I. I believe it was Wilma, she's our retired, now retired Title I coordinator, mm -hmm. correct? She had sat down with me and explained a lot of Title I to me, which I was not aware of. So I'm gonna follow up with you on some advocacy. I think that the board could help push for, maybe with the help of John, and and his partner um, maybe more at the federal level mm -hmm. to help us um, kind of help close that gap, so. Great. Um, Ms. Sawyer, I do have a question. Um, I'm referencing page two um, when we're looking at the data for the different student groups and for black males, it says 72.1% of the students are not meeting fast benchmark. Um, my question is what is being done to help um, those black males that are not meeting the FAST benchmark at this time. Yeah, so the... Actually, if I could, that oh, sounds somewhat of a how... Does that sound like how... Yep. That's what I, I didn't know. I had it in both categories, so I didn't know for sure because I was trying it's to a, change it. Yeah, so it's I'll, a great question, but we'll I'll table hold that. that question. Yep. So please okay. remind... I'm going to put a note that I have that question, and I'm going to ask a couple other questions then. Um, just good looking, AJ said good catch if you didn't hear that. So, and looking at um, just the data, I know right now that your evaluation of it is that we're not compliant. Um, what are things that you see that are working and then what are some of our limitations? Uh, although I have to say that, that this data doesn't necessarily um, reflect it, um, it's very clear that the the students are thriving under the in-person um, conditions. Um, so that's you know that's clearly working. They 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 feel good about being back at school. They're um, they're they're doing an amazing job, frankly, an amazing job of of following the mitigation strategies, especially the masks, which we really thought we would have, uh, you know, this time last year, I would have guessed that we would have had a lot of challenges with. Um, but they're they're being very consistent there. And they're that's the I mean, that's what's working. You know, they're the 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 teachers. In fact, I was in a um, uh, I happened upon a, a little meeting today in a school where uh, a counselor and a teacher were uh, working with a with a young black male student um, on the on the subject of racism. Uh, he had a, a, a complaint about uh, an alleged racist behavior. And um, although this doesn't sound like it's tied to reading specifically, um, it certainly speaks to engagement. And uh, our, our staff is working very hard to ensure that every single student um, has a, a genuine sense of belonging and has a voice in the experience that they have at school. And the higher we can get that level of engagement, especially for a population that we've traditionally underserved. And, and part of that is because, at least a, a good part of that is because they haven't felt necessarily like they were um, 
like they belonged um, in school. And so I, 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 it's really important that we highlight that. It, it, it ties in with our SEL work, but you know, the decades long um, challenge that we've had in, in having our black male students perform like we know they can um, has pointed to a lot of our behaviors that we need to change as a system. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a nationwide problem and there's all the reading strategies in the world that we can use, but if we don't have a student and, and the student's family engaged in the work and, and believing in the staff that are trying to support them, we just aren't going to get there. So I don't, I don't want that to be um, lost on, on our community because that's, that's in, in, the, in the near term, but in the long term, that's really what's going to be um, the difference maker. We have fantastic teachers um, you know, with, with really good skills in the science of teaching reading. But if we're not making that genuinely engaged connection, um, we're not going to move the needle. Now, um, the the one of the challenges that that you asked about in on page two there, Miss um, Bradley, is you see the same pattern that we saw with the all student group. Um, that is, in kindergarten, um, we're headed in the wrong direction overall, and certainly that's true with our black male students. Um, our, our, our kindergarten students, but all, all, you know, our kindergarten students this past year or this current year, you know, lost out on a chunk of preschool, which is really, really important. But even, even a, a greater impact is that only half of our students received at least half a year of preschool, half of our kindergarten students this year received half a year of preschool the year prior. Um, we know how absolutely vital that is. We've seen the data year over year over year, especially at the kindergarten level, but it also carries through um, and through many, many years after that, that a quality preschool experience makes a huge difference. And in the data that we're seeing here, I think that shines through um, very loud and clear that only half of those uh, of these this group of students are black males had a preschool experience last year of at least half a year. So that's really working against us in, in this particular population, but the, the population in general, we saw that same pattern with the kindergarten data um, in March with all third grade students. Rob or Kaylin, do either of you have questions? No? Okay. I would have um, a few questions or I just want to double check on a few things if I could, Superintendent Ehart. Just kind of curious of the schools, you know, in this report it talks about the schools, for example, page one, two, and three, uh, the schools that are meeting uh, their individual targets. Um, are you seeing any overlap of those schools? Like, are they the same schools? Are they all different schools? Uh, yeah, they tend to be. There, there is some overlap. I guess I would, I would say. Okay, and would that be the same then with when we talk about our progress measure two um, A, two B? and to see with regards to progress monitoring. Do you see some uh, of that uh, overlap as well? There is some overlap. Yeah, not 100%, but yeah, there's a, a good bit of overlap. Okay. So then that could be, I'm just kind of curious if that's, um, if there have been any trends that have been identified from those schools. Yeah, um, the, the one thing that we need to we need to look into is um, how much the virtual setting has interfered with progress monitoring. Um, certainly, when you look at um, if you look at page, I guess it's page five. Um, percent of black male first grade students not meeting benchmark who are progress monitored on CBM reading is not not where we want it there's there's a partial explanation for that however because it's not that they're not being progress monitored at all it's just that they're not being progress monitored on the curriculum based measure for reading yet 
Um, so that one could be a little bit misleading, but but generally speaking, if the, the higher of the percentage of the students who are registered at uh, who test as at risk that are receiving um, regular progress monitoring on the curriculum based measures, the more progress that they're making on the overall goal when they test on fast again. Just going through my questions. I don't think I have any additional questions at this time. So to my board colleagues, before we move into the how questions, just want to offer one more opportunity if you have any questions on the who, what, and why. I'm All right. Going, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm going to go back to Ms. Delagardel's question regarding uh, Title I and those populations having different resources than some other schools. Um, and I, I certainly believe in equitable distribution of resources, but we've identified um, We've identified this goal as as being a priority, of course, for the board. So why why is it that when we look at the percent of all students that are not meeting at 54 percent and we have an equitable distribution? Um, so 54 percent of all students on page two are not meeting the FAST benchmark, but 72 percent of our black males are not meeting if the if why is it that um, there isn't an equitable amount of growth for our black males um, if we if we are distributing resources properly and if we are approaching this equitably and perhaps it's a how question I'm sorry I was going <laughs> to say I kind of I feel it's an in between of that how question. Um, <laughs> But I would certainly want to just double check again to make sure we're removed through the who, what, and why, and then we Thank can you. lift that up. I do have one question, and sometimes my what's turn into how, so <laughs> you just stop me if that's the case. But looking at the response to data, and I know that it's talking about um, implementing high quality, cu quality curriculum and that we're working toward full implementation of the ELL curriculum, ELA, excuse me, curriculum. And I don't even know if this is being looked at, but what have we noticed about um, our black males and their response to that curriculum? Like, is it, do you feel like it's something that is working? Um, just wondering how, how engaged they are with the curriculum. Yeah, we we do think it's working. We do think students are responding well to it. I will say, and I, I we may have touched on this um, last year. One of the one of the challenges that we had with the EL curriculum, which we absolutely think is the the right um, the right curriculum um, to per, pursue for for a whole host of reasons, but especially being culturally responsive to all of our students, is that we we really cheated our teachers um, and our building leaders on the appropriate level of, of professional development that, that we normally would have had in an implementation like this because of the shifting around that we had to do with our limited time, PD time, because of the, the pandemic. So our buildings are responding really, really well, but what our elementary schools will tell you almost to a building is um, it's really been a stretch to find um, consistent periods of time to bring the, the teachers together that they want to bring together to support them in more effective implementation. So that's something that we're, we're you know, actively addressing and we'll do some catch up on that um, over the summer and then we'll have much better um, ongoing and, and timely support through the year next year. But that has been something that has been a, a barrier. Um, I wouldn't say that it impacted our black male students more than our other students, but it, it, it has been a barrier in being as effective as we as we would otherwise have been. Not to mention also, and uh, this is really evident in our classrooms right now, is 
our classrooms look so different right now. Um, all the things that we've been working, not all the things, but a, a, a lot of what we have been working on with our schools for rigor, you know, giving um, real opportunities for students to inter interact with one another and question one another. Um, a lot of that has been curtailed very dramatically by having to maintain the physical distancing um, that that we're attempting to to uh, maintain so that we can uh, continue to mitigate the challenges with COVID. So th th there are a couple of uh, those are a couple of really big um, barriers that our teachers are are valiantly trying to overcome um, in in ensuring that instruction is as strong and consistent as as we all expect it to be. And now I'm not sure if I actually answered the question. I can't. I was going to say, I do actually have. I, yeah, I think you might be muted, Kelly, but I'm not sure. Yes, I'm muted. Sorry. Okay. Um, I just noticed as I was reading through the priority actions and evidence of implementation that we have the EL curriculum at a 97%. Um, can you guys still hear me okay? Okay. That so we have it at a 97% implementation for our elementary schools. Um, but I don't see any information on where we're at at implementing for grades 6, 8. Do you happen to have that or could you provide that for us later? And I was going to say that would probably move us into another how question for the um, for the process. But are we? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Dillagardell, did you have a who, what, and why question? Yeah, my question just was what was the implementation uh, like percentage for our middle school curriculum in terms of how what's our fidelity like? Okay. And so some of that, like I, and this is where I would tend to think that that might look a little bit more like the implementation of oh, the intervention. It's just, it's just listed yeah. there for elementary. It's not listed for secondary. So that was my question oh, okay. was, what is our percentage for 6-8? So. so so Kelly, yeah. Kelly, the key distinction uh, that you want to continue leading, and you're doing a great job of this, um, is in you want to lead your board and first looking backwards to figure mm -hmm. out what has already happened and to understand that to the greatest depth possible. Uh, okay. Very important the board is really clear about what has happened in the past before the board gets into question about how are we gonna respond in the future. This particular question, um, what I hear in our inquiry is about what has happened in the past um, and what has past implementation been like. So if you hear board members starting to get into, okay, how are we gonna implement this differently? then I'd absolutely blow the whistle on that. But if they're asking okay. about what was previous implementation look like and what was the quality of that, uh, then that is within the spirit of this part of the conversation. All right, thank you, AJ. So sorry about that, Ms. Delagardell. No, that's okay. So you don't have that information readily available, Dr. Hart. Well, we have the the what's what we have recorded here is K eight. So I just made a note to break it down between K five and six eight, and I'll get that back to you. Okay, yeah, it just says elementary schools. I typically think of six eight schools as being not elementary. So maybe that's just a vocabulary thing, or because it says based on implementation, the ninety seven percent of our elementary schools are implementing the EL curriculum as intended, but there's no reference to our middle schools. Oh yeah, I'll get I'll get that number. Okay. I don't have that I, handy. Okay, because we are using that curriculum from K to eighth grade, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm I'm familiar with that curriculum in the sense that I, I teach on a daily basis, so I would just be interested to to hear maybe even and maybe this is just for me, so we should talk about that offline. But um, this actually might be a how question of um, what feedback are you getting from teachers about how the implementation has gone so far? Or from building leaders or from whoever. Yeah, actually, I've had a number of uh, a lot of conversations about that. And, and I think that overall, they say it's going really well. They're just frustrated that there's not that they didn't have as much time front time to get as comfortable with it as they would have liked. 
And then we haven't had as much opportunity because of, of shifting our PD time to do those check-ins as a, as a group and, and do as much effective PLC work and, you know, working through the wrinkles. So I think there, the, it's been overall been extremely positively received. And, and um, in fact, I want to call out Kelly Schofield because um, I can't tell you how many principals have told me over the last uh, month and a half how uh, responsive she's been and how supportive she's been um, in working with both building leadership teams and teachers. But the the barrier is time. Um, I think that's almost a universal response, building to building, um, teacher to teacher, principal to principal. And can I go ahead? I was just one more follow-up question. What support have we received from EL education in terms of providing professional development for our teachers on their curriculum, or are we doing that in house? I'll let Kelly weigh in on, on that one to give a more um, fully fleshed out response. Kelly, are, are you available? I am, and thank you, Tom, for that shout out. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, we have um, contracted with EL Curriculum to provide uh, uh, some different supports throughout um, this school year, starting, um, well, actually starting last year in the spring when we were all virtual, we were able to um, really use that time uh, to our advantage. And we worked with EL and they provided virtual training, um, the full suite of training for unpacking the curriculum and using the curriculum to all of our teachers, um, district fo folks, uh, leaders. We pretty much could train anybody and everybody that uh, would have any uh, dealings with the curriculum or be supporting schools. And that was from K to eight. And um, we also were able to get some specialized training um, around phonics uh, and the phonics uh, um, skills block for our teachers in the spring as well. And then this year we have, uh, con they are providing uh, every, every other week training to coaches. So the coaches get a one hour training um, every other week. It's on a rotation. So uh, K-5 get one week and 6-8 the next week. Um, and then, th so they're taking those topics that they had from the spring and they're breaking them down even more so that the coaches can go back and um, uh, support their PLCs and their teachers in the building. Again, time has been an issue because many of the uh, schools, because of the hybrid and the um, social distancing and the other mitigation factors we've had, have had to rearrange their schedules and their the teachers don't all have common planning time, but schools have been super creative in, in figuring out ways to do that. And um, so, uh, so I think they've used some after school time and, and uh, some virtual times to, to implement some of the things that they've learned from EL. And then we also have, um, EL has been providing um, uh, training for our leaders. So our uh, principals and our APs and our district leaders around um, the specific indicators that we're focusing on for the implementation this year. Thank you, Kelly. So, Superintendent Ahart, I would have an additional question. As you look at page, pages two and three, progress measures one A, B, and C, like in terms of, you know, trajectories of where we're hoping to go, we, you know, are obviously hoping to go up. And if you look at one B and one C, we're kind of making progress, but one A took a different turn. What is your interpretation of why um, that data? is going a little different direction. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. So I think that our our biggest, um, the, the biggest challenge clearly can, continues to be the younger the students are, um, the more challenges that we have in, in reading specifically um, for a few reasons. One, the virtual environment just is not as conducive to the instruction of reading. Um, and with these students, you know, these kindergarten students, first of all, only half of them had um, half a year of, of preschool the year prior. And so that would tell us that we would expect most of these students to be coming in with significant reading deficits, even as they enter kindergarten. Um, and then um, couple that with not having consistent daily touches with with their their regular you know 
all classroom instruction or with interventionists at the at the um, frequency that we would expect over time, which is so crucial for those early readers. Um, and and the data is is very much showing that that what we do when we have the opportunity to do it well, as last year's data suggested, um, works very well. But when we cheat, when 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 we lose time, when we lose that consistent opportunity with very frequent touches. Of, of exactly you know right on time um, instruction are, are we, we lose ground I'll, I'll just re remind them um, folks too it, it's 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 maybe it's not evident and I'm sure the board remembers this but for our, our community at home who doesn't wrestle with this every day um, when we look at that um, progress measure 1a percent of black male kindergarten students meeting fast benchmark remember that fall winter and spring that benchmark changes so um, if when we see that downward line, the, the blue line between the two red squares, while that's definitely not the trend that we want, we want it heading up. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily indicate that the students have lost ground. It's just that they're not keeping up with the, with the level of growth that we need to stay on track with the moving benchmark that the FAST tests on. If I could follow up, why do you think that is for we took a different term for kindergarten versus first and second. Was there something different with regards to those students? Well, yeah, just that their their basic skills are at a much lower level. And when the the, the younger the student and the and and the less automaticity they have in those in those real discrete skills, the harder it is to to kind of get that momentum going so when we have when we started the year they had a huge gap number one from preschool to actually starting kindergarten which was problematic and then beginning that that kindergarten instruction um, for most of our students beginning that instruction virtually and then shifting to a hybrid where they were only seeing their teacher two or three times a, a week um, with with significant gap between in-person meetings that's like a, a recipe for how not to do reading instruction and for the the younger the students are the the more of an impact that that has now i don't know if kelly wants to to elucidate that um, in more detail or in a more meaningful way yeah Kel kelly you were talking about the 1a the yeah kindergarten. correct mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I, I, I think it's if that's um, Dr. Ahart is, is saying that those kindergarten skills are so fragile and then the the target does move. So not having that time to practice them um, in person, the the um, the um, virtual it worked uh, was the least effective for our kindergarten students as far as those foundational skills and, and building those. So feel like they, they didn't have as much practice and repetition that they need. And there's a lot of skills that we're teaching between fall and winter. And so um, to, to be able to keep up with that, um, they just didn't have that with the hybrid. But we are seeing some good gains now that we have all the students back um, and we're able to um, do some acceleration uh, and, and also keep on grade level pace. Thanks, Thank Kelly. All right, other who, what, and why before we move to how? All right, Ms. Bradley, I know that you had a how question when we started our discussion, so I will I will lift the microphone to you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sawyer. I'm referencing page two, um, where it has the different various student groups about students meeting fast benchmark by student group. Um, it shows that black males, 72.1 percent, um, are not meeting um, that benchmark. And my question was, what are we doing to help the that percentage of black males who are not meeting fast benchmark. Uh, well, there are um, there the interventions that that especially for our um, 
for our in-person students. Not that our, our virtual students aren't receiving interventions, but it's more effective, obviously, in person. So our black male students are getting um, pr being provided interventions. Um, and and certainly the the data um, when our teachers and our building leaders are breaking down the data that's they're they're paying very close attention to how the black males um, fall out in the in the data analysis and ensuring that we're we're pairing um, students with the appropriate level of supports. Um, we're we're in the process. The spring break put a little bit of a wrinkle in it, but we're we're establishing um, some additional tutoring time for our black males, using um, aspiring teachers who are currently students at uh, at Drake and Grandview, um, so that we can we can provide some additional um, support, have more um, you know direct um, direct support for those black male students. Um, the the time factor, you know, as you know, we've we've added some additional time to the school day to make up for the the time in which we were out of compliance with the state. And so we really think that that the the amount of time that our students are in school and the intensity that that they're experiencing during that time is probably about as much as we, you know, that they that they can successfully undertake in a in a healthy way. So we are trying to pack uh, any any of that additional support that we're getting through community partners and through um, newly uh, newly established partnerships with Drake and Grandview at at uh, you know within the school day um, when appropriate, so that there's more frequent touches for those black male students. Um, if I could just follow up with that as well. So I know that it sounds like there's tutoring taking place. Um, as far as interventions are concerned. Um, are they meeting with an interventionist and teacher? I don't know. Do we still have an interventionist? I know I was one yeah. formerly for the district. So are our black males kind of getting double dipped where they're getting um, extra instruction to help um, push move them forward just a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to comment on this, and then I, I'll I'll ask uh, Kelly to chime in too. Um, our we do still have uh, interventionists for sure. Again, this is a, another one of those um, Title One challenges where we do, um, by virtue of Title One, have additional um, interventionists in those schools that that are supported by Title One. But remember that we do have schools that qualify for Title One that we don't have adequate funding to support with Title I. And so um, while we are, you know, we do have interventionists around the district, there's more of that intervention support in those Title I funded buildings. Um, another challenge that we we have, and I'll, actually I'm going to lift up two things, and I need to to um, see if I can get this broken down by, um, by race and gender at the elementary level. But um, we have over the course of the uh, the last two months, you know, we've had between um, the low 100s up into the mid 200s of students in quarantine. Um, I don't want that lost on people. Um, we continue to have students, um, you know, contracting COVID-19, and so they're quarantined, and they miss out on about uh, two weeks of at least in-person instruction. Some of them are able to participate virtually, so that has a, a negative impact on the consistency of interventions and um, in the consistency of the regular classroom instruction. And then finally, um, since interventionists don't have a, a, um, a, a roster of students for whom they're responsible through the day, you know, like a typical, you know, in this case, uh, a first grade um, teacher who has a, a roster of students that she supports through the day, except for when those students are at specials, our interventionists don't. Um, and and so to some degree, some of that intervention time has been compromised due to um, helping out in in uh, in areas where um, there's been some staffing um, challenges with with covid. That's not I, I don't think that's a huge, huge factor, but it certainly um, does play a, a factor in the consistency and quality of support in the intervention program. I don't know if Kelly, if you want to um, uh, speak in more detail um, on this, on that the question about interventions provided for black male students. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I 
Dr. Um, Ahart lifted up some of the challenges we ha have had with interventionists um, being pulled to cover classrooms and different things because of, of quarantines and, and also the inconsistency of interventions. But we feel like we're getting on better footing um, over the past few weeks and we're seeing a lot more consistency uh, with um, our students um, in the classroom and with the interventions. But yes, it is uh, what we call core plus more, right? So they're getting that grade level instruction and the scaffolds to access that grade level instruction um, and, the, um, and the differentiated grade level instruction, as well as an opportunity to get an intervention on top of that, which would um, be more focused on, on backfilling or discrete skills that they need. So we're working with schools um, all over our team in really setting that up because we do have you know, those, those large gaps that we need to address at the classroom level with uh, class-wide responses or class-wide intervention, so adding an extra uh, routine for phonics or phonological awareness um, for everyone, um, but then on top of that, working with them to look at the data and the uh, uh, most at-risk students, um, which are our Black males um, or where our largest gaps are and our ELL students, so really um, uh, coordinating with our special education department, our ELL department to uh, to align those interventions so that students aren't getting a really disconnected experience at school. Right? We're trying to all work on the same skills and the same um, um, strategies with them so that it can accelerate their growth. Kelly, would you, just while you're on here, um, I, t I touched on this a little bit, but not in much detail earlier, but on the on the progress monitoring data, would you again highlight what progress monitoring looks like for those students who are being progress monitored but not on the curriculum based measure? Uh, yeah, sure. We always, I mean, in first grade, have a dip from spring to fall. So you'll see fall has lower number of students being progress monitored that should be progress monitored um, based. Uh, and then it goes up in the spring and back down in the fall. And um, our measure that we have chose that that we're that that um, report is showing is the the CBM reading that fluency measure. And many times uh, the students aren't able to access that fluency measure. Like they they can't get the ten words in a minute to um, so you you would progress monitor them off grade level basically. So you're going to work on a um, it's a grade level skill, but it's a, a discrete skill like blending or segmenting or, you know, nonsense words or sight words, a different skill that's going to help them access that fluency measure, but they're not quite ready, ready for that CBM measure yet. So they are being progress monitored. Um, and we check this uh, in the past, like since since this has become a, a board goal and we're really watching progress monitoring and supporting schools, we do check that to ensure that all of our first graders are being progress monitored. You're gonna see a flip now, um, right, usually after the winter, and you start seeing more first graders um, gaining those discrete skills, those, those sight words um, and blending and segmenting, and then they move into um, then the, the fluency measure. So by spring, then we have all of our first graders being measured on that. So it really is deceiving the way it looks, but um, our first graders that should be progress monitored are being progress monitored. Thank you. I just that, that that's why that's exactly why. And so that's a, a nice illustration too of the scaffolding that our teachers continue to do to uh, bridge the the gap from where um, students are performing, meeting them where they are, and, and ensuring that they have um, access to grade level material. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I have another question, Ms. Sawyer, and I apologize if I'm dipping backwards in this. Hopefully it's forward thinking, but do you feel confident, Dr. Ahart, that we're moving in the direction that we need to move in to set our Black males up for success? Just when I look at the data, and I know there's been a lot of factors that have contributed to where we're at, but do you feel confident that the district is taking the right and appropriate steps to move us in the direction to where this time next year, we will see some sort of significant growth. Um, I very much do. Um, I very much do. Um, if we had a, a, a um, admin update this morning um, where we took about 45 minutes of time to focus on um, 
our anti-racism work. And if you could hear where our leaders are and what they're talking about and how they're attempting to support our teachers, I, I referenced earlier a, a conversation that I got to kind of sit in on in, a, in an elementary school um, today uh, where they were supporting a young man um, around a, a, an issue that he thought had to do with race. And if you hear the, the kind of conversations that are, and these are difficult conversations that our, that our teachers are, are taking on and our building leaders are taking on to, and because they're, they're dead serious, just as, as all of you are about ensuring that we see the progress that we need to see in our, in all of our students, but particularly our black male students. Um, the comments by Mr. Oliver that he makes at our um, at our at our board meetings and during public forum, all of that's very much a part of the conversation in in the district. And if you um, if you recall where we were headed uh, last year, I was so encouraged with where with the trajectory that we are on. If you talk with our teachers right now, they will tell you that they're very frustrated because they know where our kids could be. Um, they're I, I'm I'm very proud of the the resiliency that. That both our students and our teachers are demonstrating, and I'm very confident. And I, I think that our third report is going to show um, some very good evidence that we're that we're um, getting that curve back up in the trajectory that in the direction that we want to see it. And as you as you see at the end of the report, where we talk about um, um, our next steps, you know, one of those things is ensuring that when we you know first of all there's a, a huge summer programming that's that's going to happen and we're going to prioritize those students um, that um, we need to accelerate growth for to meet our board goals so that's the the first priority but the the real big thing under under next steps is ensuring that we get back to the groove that we had going on before, um, to use a term of art. Um, this year has been shifting gears, changing direction, switching modalities, um, doing work um, differently because we've had to, um, because of mitigation efforts, and because um, splitting focus between virtual students and in-person students. And it's really crucial for us that everybody is, our, our, our staff especially, our teachers are fully supported in, in getting back into that, you know, every single day, getting grade level access to every single one of our students and getting back into the, the trajectory that we had before. So while the, the, the data that you, you see in this report is discouraging to me anyway, um, I'm very confident in what I see happening and, and the conversations that I participate in that, that we're going to get back to the uh, kind of trajectory that we all expect and that our students deserve. Thank you, Ms. Sawyer. Uh, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Ms. Martrano, I believe you had a how question. I did, and now I have a different one. <laughs> Um, the conversation's kind of gone in different directions. So um, it, the response to data mirrors the response to our March 2nd, all third grade students uh, report. Um, and I'm concerned that we don't have a, how, I'm going to, place this in a, a how question, but how, how do you know that this same strategy that you're recommending for all students is going to work for black males? Well, we have evidence. Um, we have good evidence from our prior experience that if, you know, so there's, there's a qualifier here that the that students are receiving the, the level of intensity and frequency that they need so that may look different for some of our black male students than it does look for some of our other students but um how uh, a, a student develops those the foundational skills as, as kelly called them and then get to that level of automaticity where um, those discrete skills aren't a barrier for um, both their fluency and their comprehension is huge. And so 
the the progress monitoring and and the work on those discrete skills will look different on a student by student basis and for these and for black male students there will be more of those students that need more intense support in some of those discrete skills and that does look different um, it doesn't show up um, necessarily in the next steps but our teachers and our interventionists are making critical decisions about um, who needs what when and how much you know, and at what level of intensity on a, you know, on a day by day basis. And so um, the students with the most need, and in this case, are certainly our black male students are receiving um, a different level of, of support than than what may be reflected in this sort of response today to the, that encompasses the entire um, black male student population. So if the interventions are going to differentiate each student's um, progress, but we don't have the proper resources for proper interventionists, how can we as a board properly look at the budget? How can we make sure that our interventionists aren't being pulled to be subs? How can we ensure that those interventionists are truly providing intervention right now, rather than waiting until summer, waiting until, um, the full implementation of the curriculum has been completed. What what's being done right now? Well, um, first of all, the full full implementation implementation of the curriculum being at ninety seven percent implementing as intended is a very high mark. So I that's that's a, a really good number. I'm super pleased with that number. Um, we we are getting closer and closer to those barriers not being you know a barrier. Um, Again, we, we need to continue to be really, really consistent in our mitigation efforts because as I said, um, every day when I look at our, our report on both adults and students, we're, you know, it's not unusual for a dozen more students or, or more to be identified as having contracted the virus anytime there's an absence, either a student absent or a, or a staff absent absence. Um, when you don't have the person who has the specific training and has had the opportunity to build the relationship with the students, you're taking a, you know, you're taking a step back. So any of those things in, at, at any time are going to have a deleterious effect on progress. What we're, what we're facing in much higher numbers this year is, you know, more frequency of, of absences. So there's no waiting. Um, you know, there's a, there certainly is less of a, of a shortage now of, adults that 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 can cover for um, an unusual you know number of absences and so forth but that that's going to continue to be um, compared to a normal year a little bit more of a challenge you know than normal as far as um, generating um, you know what the board can do um, you know we are um, we need <laughs> this is old but we need to get more consistent appropriate level of funding that recognizes um, the the negative educational correlates of poverty you know so that we have uh, a level of funding that that is required to climb the hill that we're asked to climb with the uh, you know with the the uh, population that we're attempting to serve so one of the things that that will happen um, that already is happening to a degree, that, but but we don't want to create a structural budget issue is providing some of our ESSER sources resources um, to provide additional support. However, um, that's a real dangerous game to play because if you if you start um, if you start adding one-time funding for um, for ongoing positions, you you run into a problem really fast. So we have to be very judicious in how we, you know, how we exercise that um, that temptation. Um, so I don't want to to give the impression that anybody is waiting. We're not we're not waiting to make these things better. We're we're getting consistently better um, day over day, day over day. But there are there are going to be some limitations this year um, over which we really don't have control, um, and money wouldn't fix it. So. Um, there's no waiting. Dr. Hart, I just would like to piggyback off of something you said, and maybe this 
this I think is a who question, but it didn't dawn on me until I was listening to you talk. Um, because we, we know and recognize as a board that there are ways in which poverty interacts with our students and additional issues of you know race or special education qualification or 504s or other things can interfere with that. But I also don't want us to make a direct relationship between poverty and race because those two things don't always come hand in hand. And so I want to make sure that our board and our staff are not assuming that all of our black students are going to fall in poverty or, or making those assumptions. So do we have data where that's kind of broken out? Um, I don't have that with me, but I will bring that. I, I will provide that for the board and have it with me at the next at the next report. I don't have that broken down K three and what the percentage of of um, black males are that qualify for free and reduced. And and forgive me if that was the impression I was I was making. But one of the things that, regardless of of what um, different populations uh, a student may fall in, when the system is asked to, to you know, to address uh, the, all of those, um, all of those challenges, where you know, with, with the same resources that another district that doesn't have the same challenges, and you have the same funds to work with. That's really what I was trying to get at, because everything has to, you know, everything. There, there's a, a um, that robbing Peter to pay Paul syndrome. You know, um, ends up being the that continuous cycle. So, if there's not enough resources to go around everyone's going to pay for it, you know, um, whether they're, um, whether they, um, come from a disadvantaged home or not. Okay. Yeah. And I guess I just wanted to make sure that we were acknowledging that those two facts were not necessarily mutually exclusive, not that you were saying that, but just that we yeah. were acknowledging that at the board table. And I also think that helps us consider, and, and maybe if that data has not been looked at, it helps us to determine if our, if our black males who are, you know, meeting this, you know, if they do all happen to fall in a certain socioeconomic status, or if that's completely disconnected from that, I just think that that level of specificity, specific, ah, sorry, um, just getting down to that level helps us to better understand and create better interventions for our students and to better understand, understand the intersections at which our students live every single day. Mm -hmm. If I could, um, so. I, I just want to um, acknowledge uh, uh, that in the public forum, well, I want to, you know, the, there's the, what's underneath this number, the, the one number that we monitor for this particular report. And um, I've been thinking about what Michael Davenport said in the, in the public forum about the overvaluing of, of assessments in what we do uh, as public education system and um, there's a lot of really good work that has gone into um, the final data point that that we're fixated upon and the, and the points underneath it teachers and administrators who've switched educational models who have worked through some really trying circumstances and uh, and I just want to from the board's perspective um, make sure that there's a note of appreciation and grace that our numbers overall are not where they we want them to be but as a district we're putting in the work and dr ahart's done a very good job of answering questions tonight and all of this is relevant because kim asked what what we can do as a board and so the um in my role on the polk county early childhood iowa we were um, getting some presentations today for our next round of grant funding. And Susie Guest was one of the presenters talking about um, preschool and um, and the, the grant that we get there. And she was telling us a little bit about what to expect for, for summer school. And the um, one of the things really struck me, which is we're going to be somewhat limited by the, about the number of students that we can serve in summer school based on the number of teachers who are signed up to teach summer school. And Susie was talking specifically at preschool, but my anticipation is that's going to be the same everywhere. And she was noting that, you know, they're prioritizing the kids that are going to need the help the most, which I think is a 
pretty courageous thing to do, given what we're, you know, whenever you have to make a choice one way or the other. And so from a board perspective, I want to make sure that I'm I'm affirming the work that our staff is doing because we're asking them to potentially take on a month or two more months of work over the summer and string out what's already been a very long year. Um, and I, I want them to know we're in it with them from the board's perspective, that we we value their work, that we have grace and not seeing the final end point that we want, but we know that there's a lot of really hard work and a lot of sacrifice that's gone into it. And we know that there's going to be more because am I right, Dr. Ahart, this would be year one of hopefully a three-year commitment to this type of uh, summer school. Yeah, actually it's a, it's year one and what I hope is a four-year commitment, but um, we're, we're kind of wrestling with the, the state right now. We have uh, um, the, the federal guidance will, would allow us to spend through um, a fourth summer but the um, our our state department of education is saying we're going to have to close it down prior to that, so we're we're trying to work that out. The federal guidance allows for it, but the states do have some ability to to put further restrictions on it, and uh, that's a, a a a case that we're making at present to ensure that we can budget this out through four summers. Great. Well, I just. Uh... I'm I'm impressed with the work that we're putting in, and I am awed by the amount of work that our staff and um, and our administrators have done already to this point, and I'm very much appreciative of it. Thank you, Rob. Are there other how questions from board colleagues? Superintendent Ahart, I did have one quick follow-up question and this I'm trying to remember whose question it was um, but you were talking about uh, title one challenges and you said that we have schools that qualify for title one but do not have availability of funds to support that can you just talk further about that is that something that we need to be looking at uh, with but is it something with our budget how that's worked out is there another yeah that's a, to fix that? there 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 really isn't anything we can do about it uh, we've we've stretched our our um, flexibility uh, in terms of federal regulations about as far as we can and, and sometimes we have to navigate kind of creatively with the state who actually plays that intermediary role um, but the but whenever the the federal government does an audit of any programs, it's a ninety nine percent chance that they'll look directly at what what's happening in Des Moines just because we're the the largest and we're the most convenient um, to if you're visiting Iowa from out of state. But the 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 basic problem is is that you you have to first of all, Title one has never been fully funded. So that's the the first issue. So it's it's intended to provide additional funding to all schools that have, uh, greater than 40% free reduced price lunch um, population that they serve in their school. Well, you only get a certain amount of money and, and they re the, the federal government requires you to spend at a certain per pupil level at each building that you support with Title I. And to do that in our district, and, and it's not unique to Des Moines, it's just that the, the, the higher your percentage of free and reduced price lunch, the bigger the challenge is. So we have a number of, of schools every year that that are beyond the that far exceed the 40% threshold that receive no Title I funding because we don't receive enough Title I dollars to allocate that on a per pupil basis at the level that the federal government requires because they want there to be a, a, a enough investment in each building that receives those dollars to you know to actually make a difference. And so we we get as creative as we can with that, but there's always buildings, um, schools that far exceed the 40% um, poverty rate that just don't, um, that we just don't have enough dollars to go around um, to, to include them. Do you know about how many schools that is and are there other funding streams? Well, the, we the, problem, the problem with other funding streams is that the the way the the since since ESSA was was um, passed back in uh, fifteen or sixteen, the you you 
Title I, you have to demonstrate that the Title I dollars that you're providing to a building are above and beyond the, any other funding that you give to to the other schools. So you have to be able to demonstrate that, and I'm just going to toss two schools out, don't put any <laughs> any weight on this, but if Hubble were Title I and Greenwood were um, not Title I, we would have to demonstrate that they got all of the local and state funding equivalently before we gave the Title I dollars to Hubble. So they make it really difficult to provide additional um, resources to a school that isn't receiving a Title I, even if it qualifies for Title I, because how they look at it is the schools that are funded as Title I are one group of schools, and the schools that aren't, whether they qualify or not, if they're if they are not receiving Title One funds, then you need to resource them the same. We should maybe do a whole workshop on this. This is something that yeah in uh, <laughs> in regulations negotiations um, back in in 2016 that I was a, a part of. We we fought um, very hard against this. Uh, not just th that because that's actually not new, but the um, the dollar for dollar accounting for the, the those resources, so that if if I hire Kelly and I hire um, Kirsten as Title One interventionists, let's say, and 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 Kelly takes family insurance and she's um, you know has a, a master's degree and a lot more years of experience than Kirsten, Kelly's going to be more expensive, right? But it, we, so we used to just average that out. An interventionist was the average cost of a teacher, right? So you could use it, and that's how we we that's how we budgeted the Title I for personnel. We can't do that anymore. So now it's the actual cost of the person. Um, so there could be a thirty thousand dollar swing between um, two interventionists, and so um, one building with the same amount of money might you know, might be able to afford two interventionists and another one um, may only be able to support one and then have some other money left over that um, that they have to use for something else. But in, in, in the name of equity, they made it very difficult to support all of our students in poverty equitably is the, the long and short of it. Are there additional questions. Kaylin, do you have any questions? No, I mean, all the, the foundational ones are basically the same that we covered in March. So, so yeah, I'm just going to wait till see what the next report brings. Okay. All right, Madam Chair, I would turn it back to you if you want to lead us through the vote. Yes. Um, before you, oh, yep. Before I was going to turn it away, over to you, AJ. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, before you walk away from that, um, whoever is facilitating, um, I would generally encourage, if it didn't come up in conversation, to as one of your concluding uh, questions in the about what's going to happen next is how can the board support, or what are specific things you're going to need from the board over the next six to nine months to really be supportive in this area and give your superintendent an opportunity to tee up uh, some of uh, the ways that the board can uh, play a positive role in this process. And so before you switch away uh, as, as the facilitator for this section, you might ask that yourself. All right, Superintendent Ahart, how might the board uh, support you in this process for the next six to nine months so that we can um, see growth with our third grade black males. Well, one of the biggest, thank you for the question. I, I think one of the, thank you for the question, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I didn't have my mic on. Um, as we, you know, as we continue to pursue equity, um, there, anytime you, you, you try not to equally distribute everything, but to distribute resources on a, on a, um, as needed basis or on a on per need, um, as as Mr. Barron referenced earlier, um, we are we we don't have unlimited capacity 
Uh, we're, we're actually be, I'll take this opportunity to mention that on Monday, we're going to begin polling families about their uh, interest in, you know, tell them what the, the, the basics of what the summer programming will look like and try to get uh, uh, an initial read on, on how much interest we have. And if we don't have enough staff um, at, at various levels, we're, we'll go back and, and um, recruit internally, but we'll, we'll probably re be recruiting outside the district too for additional teachers to make sure that every single student that we can recruit into the summer program is told yes. Um, but that being said, we are prioritizing um, around a couple of different um, a couple of different measures. One is, the board goals and um, others are are seniors who are who at the high school level seniors who are credit deficient um, so unless you know if, if we have to limit enrollment in summer programming it will be based on need and in order for us to provide as much equity of outcome as we can and so it'll be really important for me and for the team to have the support of the board and making what we hope won't be very many um, tough decisions because we won't be able to say yes probably to everyone. And so we have to, instead of just doing a first come first serve, we really need to prioritize to ensure that we're moving the needle um, for what the, the board and, and what our team is viewing as our priorities. So that's something that sometimes politically can be a bit of a challenge and it's and it's not fun to say no. And oftentimes the, the folks that most need um, our extra support are those least able to advocate for themselves. And so um, it's going to be really important that collectively as a team that we have that consistent message that the board goals are our board goals and that that is how we're directing um, the investment of our resources in order to um, in order to provide not only equity of access but equity of outcome ultimately. So that's the that's my I think my biggest ask for the board is to be cognizant of that and um, that we're all singing from the same hymnal when um, tough decisions in that regard need to be made. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sawyer, for facilitating the conversation. Thank you to my board colleagues for participating in the conversation and asking some really great questions. Before we um, vote on this, I would like to just preface this also for the community as you hear us have these conversations. The desired result of monitoring, monitoring is to understand the current reality um, for our students as compared to the vision we've adopted for them, which is the goals. Rather, we, we enjoy the current reality isn't the point of monitoring whether or not you fully know what you know the current reality is. And so this evening, just keep that in mind when we are voting on this, that um, I know we're not always happy with the things that we hear, but we are accepting the report based off of the current reality that we are currently in and also um, the fact the, the district is having a plan and a path forward. So in saying that, may I have a motion in a second to accept item E1, third grade reading, Black Males Monitoring Report. Donald Gardell, so moved. Sawyer, second. We have a motion by Ms. Della Gardell and a second by Ms. Sawyer. Um, Ms. Jenkins, will you please take the vote? Mr. Barron? Uh, yes. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Mr. Cody? Yes. Ms. Della Gardell? Yes. Ms. Martirano? Yes. Ms. Sawyer? Yes. The vote is approved 6 0. The next item on the agenda we have is just for information only and I will just point this out to my board colleagues it is Head Start Policy Committee meeting minutes um, and it looks like there's multiple meetings there that information only item. Our next is items of privilege next on the agenda of items of privilege do we have any board members um, that have comments to share uh, Ms. Sawyer do we have a plat meeting coming up? We do. I was going to have Ms. Martirano report out oh, on that. Okay, Ms. Martirano. 
We do have a community legislative action team meeting this Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, you can sign up for that either via our Facebook page um, or um, our website. And we are going to be having conversation around uh, poverty and school funding. So um, we are going to engage in that conversation with uh, our legislators and as well as some community partners. So I welcome everyone and ask that you please attend. Um, we just finished our second funnel at the state house and uh, things are moving fast and furious and your involvement is crucial uh, in in the process um, and engaging our legislators so please join us saturday april 10th 9 a.m via zoom great thank you ms marciano is there anything else from my board colleagues um i would just like to echo um my vice chair, Mr. Barron, is he talked about teachers and the great work that you're doing. Um, as we were going through that report, I had planned during this items of privilege time to really thank our teachers and our staff for the work that they're doing. Um, me being a former teacher, I could not imagine um, what you all are going through during this time. And we appreciate you and value you and the work that you're doing for our district. Um, we know that you are working hard to make sure that our students are successful and you are balancing that in a time that we've never been through before. And so I wanna make sure that you know that even though this board has some really tough conversations and we ask some questions as we wanna gain a better reality of what's going on in our district, those questions, I hope as you're hearing them, it does not um, diminish the fact that we do, we do see the work that you're doing and we value and appreciate you. So I just want to thank all of the staff and the work that you do for Des Moines Public Schools. You are greatly appreciated. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ahart for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Um, I shared this with, uh, I'm not sure how many were here. I shared this with uh, Ms. Sawyer earlier, but uh, Ms. Martorano mentioned our CLAT meeting on Saturday. Um, we did uh, receive word today that um, the Senate um, passed the, our ELL bill, and so now that's all all done except for the governor's signature. So, um, you know, evidence that I know it's you know we've we've been talking about this. We got something done in, back in 2013, and we had a little um, thought we had some some mojo going, and you know, there's an election every two years, and the the players change, but. Um, despite all the challenges that we've had um, legislatively and, and, uh, and politically, um, that's a really a win. So that's a real tribute to the engagement of, of our community legislative action team and our partners at Policy Works, and uh, you know, just persistent pressure over time to, to, to move the needle. Um, so that's, that's really good news that, that all of us should celebrate. Um, another thing I wanted to note, you know, a lot of districts have pushed pause on their on whatever kind of student achievement goals that that they had in place prior to the pandemic year. And I think it's important for us to note that we have not done that. I know we're not seeing the numbers where we would like to see them, but I want everyone to recall that we're taking this very seriously and we really have the arrows pointed in the right direction prior to the um, prior to the interruption last March. And um, I think we're we're going to be feeling much more encouraged before we get to the end of this year and the direction that things are headed. Um, unfortunately, when we have an influx of, of resources so that we can do some really amazing things over the summertime, um, this especially this year, it's coming at a time when people are just spent and exhausted and and working through this, um, you know, just this uncertain environment that we've been in for a year. Um, so I really encourage all of our staff, if, if you've not looked at, at what, we're, um, what we're doing this summer, um, you think you might want to um, earn some, some uh, extra salary. Um, we are offering a really, um, I think, attractive package. And um, I would encourage you when you receive an email, another email recruiting you to really click on the link and see, see uh, what advantages um, you can partake of either in the first session or the second session this summer. Um, we know our teachers are who we really need working with our students. Um, we'll, we'll try to recruit from outside of the district if needed, but, um, 
but we have a, an incredible staff and we've asked an awful lot of you, but um, I think we have some really good opportunities to provide great experiences for our students this summer and would like to see all of you who can take part. Um, also wanted to give a shout out to the uh, DMEA um, as we go through the Health Benefits Advisory Committee that has representation from all of our employee groups. Um, we, you know, those are always challenging conversations and the, the health benefits, uh, medical insurance specifically landscape has changed pretty dramatically over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And we've, we've really not changed that much. And uh, it's, it's, we, we committed uh, collectively that uh, after negotiations, we would sit down and begin in earnest examining what that whole environment looks like and how we can um, um, make a real, take a real critical look at how we're providing benefits, what it, what's the, the greater um, metro and beyond landscape look like, and how can we continue to provide best in class health benefits while also ensuring that we keep a very competitive salary schedule. So um, we've started those conversations. I met with the DMEA executive um, leadership team last week as just the very first initial conversation and one that we're going to be digging into very deeply um, as we move forward through the spring and into the summer so that we don't have that sort of anxiety ridden conversation um, that we're trying to resolve every year prior to the beginning of negotiations. And like I shared with the, the DMEA team, you know, those changes to chapter 20 that came about back in 2016 have only made this more difficult. Um, we were always able to work through those things, um, I think pretty smoothly through negotiations. Now we're not, not allowed to, um, so we have to do it in a different manner. So I really appreciate uh, DMEA's willingness to, to sit down and have those um, challenging, but I think ultimately fruitful discussions. And then finally, um, I just wanted to remind folks that the annual plant sale at the um, Ag Campus will begin officially on Monday to the public. Um, they have, they've been doing a really, really good job of diversifying their inventory. Um, the students have been working exceedingly hard um, and they have a, an inventory that you just won't find um, anywhere else at, at Earl May or the big box stores. Um, and as you know, they, they use the proceeds of those of the plant sale to do all sorts of really um, meaningful and special um, educational extension experiences, including um, international travel. Um, and while you're there, you can check out the new building that replaced the, uh, the last two portables that we had in the district. Um, you can see the new, um, they're not so tiny now, but the new lambs. Um, and check out the new Central Market. It had its grand opening last week, and they have um, egg program um, produced eggs, a variety of um, other um, produce and and meats, and it's really uh, it's really something special. Locally sourced produce um, that's available right at the uh, ag campus. So um, I encourage everyone to check that out and get there um, Monday. It'll go on for you know several weeks, but the best pickings are the first pickings. So that's all I have for tonight, Ms. Bradley. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahart. I would like to thank my board colleagues for their time this evening, and I would like to thank you, the community, for listening in to our board meeting this evening. This meeting is adjourned at 7.52 p.m.